Hello and welcome to another installment of Pediatric Lectures. In a previous tutorial, we talked about normal growth. In this tutorial, we'll talk how to assess a child with short stature. Now before that, let's understand the significance of short stature. For the child, it is a source of great psychosocial stress. Ask Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones. And for us pediatricians, it is an important clue because it may be the first and at times only sign of an underlying disorder. So warrants a proper evaluation. But how do you define short stature? And the answer is a statistical one. So if the child's height is less than third percentile or two standard deviation below the mean for age and sex of the child, then the child is having a short stature. There's another definition and that is of growth failure, which basically means that the growth velocity is below 25th percentile for the given age and sex. Now, what produces short stature? And to understand that, you need to look at growth basic requirement. And it basically means that the cells should be normal. They should be getting good nutrients in a proper hormone milieu with good health and happiness. All that would in synchronization produce proper stature. An aberrancy may produce a short stature. So you need to look at short stature under two headings, physiological and pathological. In physiological stature, the entity is of familial short stature, which is nothing but a reduced genetic potential in terms of stature. There is another entity known as constitutional delaying growth and puberty, which basically signifies that the pubertal spurt is delayed, right? The pathological entities are numerous and can be summarized as skeletal dysplasias, which produce disproportionate short stature, nutritional causes, endocrinal causes such as hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, Cushing syndrome, syndromes such as Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, chronic diseases like chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease will produce short stature and then drugs such as prolonged steroids. And finally, psychosocial deprivation is also an important cause of short stature. Now, how do you assess short stature? And the assessment is basically in steps, right? So the first step would be anthropometry. And this anthropometry will establish where the concerns of short stature are really clinically significant. The second step would be a detailed history and examination to unravel the underlying clues. Third one would be to understand the genetic potential of the child. So you need to calculate the mean parental height and the target height range. Then you need to know the bone age and this will tell you about the potential left to grow. And last, based on the clues unraveled, you will decide the investigations, right? Now let's look at all these five steps one by one. Step one is anthropometry. As we said, it basically unravels whether the concerns are clinically significant and it will help you calculate the height age and the weight age. Let's give you examples of what can be clinically significant concern for evaluation. So here we have a child 13 years of age who is having 120 centimeters of height. And when we plot, we find that the child is very short and the height standard deviation score is less than minus three standard deviation. This is a straight indication to evaluate. How do you calculate height age? And the idea is to know at what age 120 centimeters, as in this example, would be 50th centile, right? So as we have plotted, we find that the height age for 120 centimeters is six and a half years, right? This is how you calculate height age. The example of clinically significant indication to evaluate growth would be a child who is between minus three to minus two standard deviation scores and is having poor growth velocity. Right, so short with poor growth velocity. And finally, a child who's not growing at all, so complete growth failure, and that also would be an indication to evaluate. So as we see that if you are plotting them correctly on growth chart, that is the first step, and that will tell you 
whether the concern is clinically significant or not. The next step is history and clinical examination. And few important points are age of onset. So in our growth tutorial, we talked that there is this ICP model. So infancy nutrition is the prime predictor for growth. In childhood period, growth hormone access is important. And in puberty, the sex steroids are important. So they can be good clues to look at. Then a review of past records will tell you about growth velocity and also unravel any clues regarding systemic illnesses which may be hidden. Birth history is important in terms of gestation and weight. So IUGR and preterms are very special categories. Also history of prolonged neonatal jaundice or neonatal hypoglycemia will tell you about probably panhypopituitarism. Drug history of prolonged steroids is an important clue. Similarly, if nutritional etiologies are thought of, a good dietary history will unravel it. Finally, family history is very, very important in evaluating short stature. So family short stature can be deciphered just through good history. History of delayed achievement of menarche in mother or delayed uh, you know, shaving in father. That will tell you about CDGP. Right, so delayed puberty. And don't miss out on the aspect of social history, especially in terms of emotional deprivation and family discord, which may be the reason for psychosocial deprivation, emotional deprivation bringing about short stature. In examination, a good general and systemic examination is important, but there are other aspects to it as well. So measurements such as upper segment, lower segment ratio is very important. If it is increased, echondroplasia, Turner syndromes need to be you know, looked at carefully. And a decreased upper segment, lower segment ratio is found in spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Arm span, if it's decreased, you need to look at echondroplasia properly. And then there is something called a rhizomelic index, which is the ratio of length from shoulder to elbow and then elbow to metacarpal. And if it is less than 0.98, then skeletal dysplasias and disproportionate short stature should be thought of. And in, as you examine, you'll find that there are, you know, set clues. So if you are having disproportionate short stature in your examination finding, you should be thinking of skeletal dysplasia. So typical dysmorphism and you can associate them to certain syndromes. Signs of micronutrient deficiencies wasting will point towards nutritional etiology. Obesity, maxillary hypoplasia, micropenis, you know, other midline deformities would point towards growth hormone deficiencies. And in hypothyroidism, you find core species and intellectual disabilities. There can be multiple similar set pieces but the idea is to corroborate the findings, put them together, and then think of an etiology. While uh, we are on examination, sexual maturity rating or Tanner staging is very important. In boys, it is done in terms of the penile length, the pattern of pubic hair, and the testicular volume. And in females, it's done in terms of the breast growth and the pubic hair pattern and the grades are 1 to 5. The importance of SMR lies in the fact that in boys the pubertal spurt starts at around 4 ml of testicular volume and is at its peak at around 10 ml of testicular volume. While in girls the peak growth uh, velocity is just prior to attainment of minaki, right? So through SMR you would be able to predict whether the pubertal spurt has happened or not. Puberty is delayed in CDGP, hypopituitarism, and Turner syndrome and that is sort of important to remember when you are evaluating short stature. The third step as we discussed is the calculation of the mean parental height or the target height. and these are the formulas. So basically it's an average of mother and father's height and you add 6.5 centimeters or 13 divided by 2 for males and for females, you'd subtract minus 6.5 centimeters from the average of father and mother's height. Where does this 13 come from? It basically is the 
average difference in height of a male and a female right and once you have calculated mean parental height you add six centimeters and subtract six centimeters and that would be the target height range for the given individual and you plot this mean parental height at 18 years of age to give a prediction of the targeted height that the child will achieve following its genetic potential right so if it becomes a bit confusing let's exemplify it so we have this child who is around 108 centimeters at 8 years of age which as you see is less than minus 3 standard deviation score but what we find it also is the fact that the father's height is 150 centimeters and mother's height is 142 centimeters so we already know that probably the genetic potential is less so the, if you calculate the mean parental height it would come to 152.5 centimeters right and the target range obviously will be plus 6 so 158.5 centimeters and minus 6 146.5 centimeters so this is the range in which this particular child should be if he follows his genetic potential and if we draw a curve parallel to the nearest Z score curve we find that actually this child is following his genetic potential right so all we need to do in this child is to follow the child and no more investigations would be warranted right so that is the importance of calculating the target height and the mean parental height the fourth uh, step is bone age it basically tells you about the skeletal maturity it correlates with the sexual uh, maturity ratings and therefore speaks of the remaining remaining growth potential and can be a, used to predict the adult height right the ways to do it is through a tanner white house uh, uh, scale or a grillic pile scales which are basically an album in which there are photographs of left wrist uh, AP view x-rays and you compare the given x-ray with that album to assess the bone age now there are different kinds of age that we have talked about as we have gone through this tutorial so bone age height age chronological age and weight age right so an interrelationship between these different terms also gives you good clues so if you have a child whose bone age is corresponding to his chronological age but the height is less than that right then you should be thinking of familial short stature cdgp on the other hand will have a bone age which is equal to the height age but definitely less than the chronological age that is to say that the bone age is delayed in nutritional entities the weight effect is affected severely height age is less than the bone age and less than the chronological age as well whereas in endocrinal entities bone age suffers the most and is less than the height age which in turn is less than the chronological age and this assessment gives you good clues finally step 5 and that is of investigations and you can look at the investigations in two ways. level 1 corresponds to those investigations which are used to rule out the chronic underlying systemic illnesses right so hemogram lft kft blood gas for something like a renal tubular acidosis urine analysis stool examinations and then few specific ones thyroid function test will help you unravel hypothyroidism anti tissue transglutaminase antibodies are uh, good screening tests for celiac disease which may present as uh, isolated short stature without any intestinal manifestations and therefore is recommended to be included in the level one of investigations if you are dealing with a girl child with short stature karyotyping and pelvic ultrasound is indicated to rule out something like a turner syndrome level two investigations are to determine the igf growth hormone axis and you need to do a good neuroimaging as well right how do you evaluate this igf growth hormone axis and this is what the next slide is all so basically before you decide to evaluate the growth hormone axis there must be some 
ऑक्सोलॉजिक एबनॉमिलिटीज एंड दोज आर if the air is severe short stature so the height standard deviation score is less than minus 3 standard deviation if the growth velocity is reduced and it's less than 2 standard deviations or if there are features of growth hormone deficiency such as you know obesity maxillary hypoplasia micropenis etc or if there is history of brain tumor cranial irradiation or if you find a pituitary abnormality on neuroimaging may be incidental right so if these um, few of these oxologic abnormalities are present what you need to do you need to get a serum igf1 and igf binding protein 3 levels right and based on that if the igf1 igf binding protein 3 levels are above mean then all you need to do is to monitor the height velocity however if that is low the igf bp3 igf1 level then you need to do growth hormone stimulation test another indication to do the growth hormone stimulation test is if the height standard deviation score of that particular patient is less than 2.25 standard deviations right in this regard we must also tell you that the basal growth hormone estimation is of no use right because the pulsatile nature of the growth hormone secretion now stimulation test utilize pharmacological agents such as arginine clonidine insulin levodopa glucagon or propranolol and ideally you should be doing tests with two different pharmacological agents based on the results that you get growth hormone if it is less than minus uh, less than 7 nanograms per uh, milliliter then you should be thinking of growth hormone deficiency however if the growth hormone is more than 15 nanogram per milliliter you need to do a growth hormone binding protein assay and if that is less than two standard deviation then you should be thinking of igf disorders and you need to do a insulin like growth factor generation test there may be a third condition in which the growth hormone is more than 10 nanogram per ml and yet the height is less than minus 2.25 standard deviation score and this is the condition which we call as idiopathic short stature right that was about how to evaluate short stature and two slides on management and the idea is basically to treat the underlying etiology give good nutrition and provide psychosocial support the indications of growth hormone therapy is often asked and the approved indications are growth hormone deficiencies short stature in a child with chronic kidney disease turner syndrome small for gestational age child who has failed to catch up prader-willi syndrome idiopathic short stature shox gene haploinsufficiency and noonan syndrome hope you remember that right that was how we assess a child with short stature thank you